could your next surgery in your local hospital be performed by a robot controlled by somebody on the other side of the, the world, somebody who is an expert in that field? Could your next house, the next house that you build, let's say you want to build a house, could you design it in VR first, test everything out, lay down all of the, the groundwork, all of the where everything's going to be in that house, in that space? And then once the house is built, that house be aware, if you will, of where it's inefficient. What appliances are drawing the most power? What parts of the house don't need heating? Can the house then learn? So digital twinning, which we'll get to the kind of the definition in a bit, that's something that would allow that kind of thing to happen. So before we get to that, I want to talk about a bit of a whistle stop tour of some of the enabling technologies that allow digital twinning to happen. So each of these digital, each of these uh, enabling technologies, we'll talk a little bit about about where they are now. So we're reaching, I think, a bit of a milestone in that a lot of these technologies have existed for a long time, and they are evolving all the time. And we are reaching that point where it's kind of things are becoming possible or interesting, particularly uh, from my point of view, that off the shelf idea. Some of you may have noticed this Christmas tree here, which we'll feature later on. This is all off the shelf components. Nothing here was it was just all purchased from from uh, online uh, and every and the VR headset you'll see later on. You can pop out now and buy one of those uh, relatively easily. So we're going to look through a different few different types of technologies. The Internet of Things you may have heard of. That's really just lots of stuff connected to the Internet. So the Internet's been around a long time and we'll get to communication methods later on. But everything is connected up. My this pie is now currently connected to my phone. This headset is connected to my phone. There's a Chromecast connected to my phone. My laptop is connected to my phone. So everything is running through that. So um, your fridge, there are fridges that have screens on the outside and you can kind of pre-order what you want. Um, there are, has anyone got a smart thermostat maybe where you can, it will learn over time about the, the house and the temperature and when you're there. So my phone, as I leave the house, will say, oh, you're no longer in the house. Let's turn the heating off. At which point all the kids say, but we're still here, you know, but, but then why not? Those things happen already. But that Internet of Things, all of that stuff connected together is really quite interesting. The downside, of course, is there's a lot of data. So if you think about all of the things that you have, you probably have devices on you now that are connected to the Web all of the time. You probably have devices at home that are connected to the Web all the time or connected to the Internet. That's a lot of data. If you think about how much data is being sent, how many packets of data is being sent, um, for example, on some of my research, I have a heart rate monitor, and that's it's quite slow, but it pulls at 125 hertz. So there's 125 bits of data per second being sent out. So the next challenge, another another field uh, of uh, moving forward, is the idea of big data. I think some of you will have heard the term big data. It's it's been around for a few years now, and I think in the Internet of Things field, it still works. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of data being sent from those devices and us sending data back. The important bit though with big data is the analytics side of things. So understanding that data. It's all very well getting a lot of data, but what do you do with it? How do you interpret it? How do you make sense of it and then do something with that data? And that's where analytics comes in, in order to make some interesting decisions or maybe those decisions are around safety. You know, if this vehicle keeps crashing when it goes over this speed, let's apply a limit to the speed of that vehicle or those kinds of things. But the analytics bit in the middle, we as humans, we, there's no way we can deal with that much data and spot patterns. That's the important bit, spotting patterns, seeing things that we as humans wouldn't necessarily see, you know, once all of that data starts to become uh, uh, visible or captured. So then we move on to AI and machine learning. So they're slightly different. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, I must, I, I'd imagine, unless you're living under a rock, you've, you can't have avoided ChatGPT, which is an incredible linguistic uh, AI system where you can ask it questions and it will, it will return answers. Almost, you know, replacing common search engines. It's so good, um, and it, it, it's very clever bit of AI. It's not true, true AI, but it is, it is clever. But below that, there's machine learning, and machine learning is using algorithms to try and understand that data learn over time to be better at understanding that data and interpreting that data to allow us to then make those decisions. So 
um, these smart thermostats in houses, for example. To begin with, you just set what you would like. You say, I'd like it to be 25 degrees. I'd be a bit warm, wouldn't it? Let's go 21. I'd like it to be 21 degrees. And then over time, it starts to say, well, yeah, but you weren't here for half the day, so we'll turn it down. And then the day that you work from home, you turn it back up, and it realizes that every Wednesday, that's what you do. I'm always amazed that when I get in the car on a Thursday night, my phone says, oh, it'll take you 10 minutes to get to Taekwondo because I take my daughter to Taekwondo on a Thursday. I never told it that, but it's realized over time that that's what I do on a Thursday. So that kind of machine learning applied to a lot of data coming in from a smart house or wherever it might be, allows it, uh, a system to learn from that and interpret. Um, robotics, so I've got a few videos playing here. <clears throat> some of you might be aware of uh, Boston Dynamics in the top left. They make some incredibly clever uh, biped and quadruped robots, which are, in terms of realism, again, quite scary, almost to that point of like, is that a person in a suit? Uh, the, the way that it's working. But telepresence is another idea, a part of this, a, a larger part of this, thinking of a digital twin of yourself. If I couldn't be here physically today, could I have wheeled in on one of those little robots and be just a little iPad talking to you? I mean, it wouldn't be quite the same, would it? 3D is definitely better. But um, but the, 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 prog the um, progress that's being made in robotics generally, I think for, it makes for some quite compelling use cases for the future. I mean, they send the Mars rover up there because, well, one, it's really expensive to get us there, but we probably wouldn't come back. Yeah, so let's send a robot instead. If we move on to an, another interesting idea, so there's lots of different bits, and we're going to bring them all together at the end, um, is this idea of photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is the, the science, if you will, of creating uh, 3D objects from photo data. And you can do this on your phone, and in fact, I'm just going to quickly demonstrate what happens? You can see the video running in the bottom corner there. So uh, that video in the bottom is flying a drone over a, a garden scene, taking lots of photos. And you see as the time goes on through the video that the processing happens. And it's really just triangulation. So if you have two cameras or, or multiple cameras looking at a particular scene, then recognizing the same uh, part of that scene in both images creates an opportunity for triangulation. You can see in the, the top left, that opportunity. So if I, and what's most amazing about this to me is if this works, it does good, is that we can do this real time. This is just a normal phone, normal iPhone. There's nothing special about it. But you can see now that I, uh, I'm just going to turn around. So this will be very crude uh, in that I'm not going to try not to get any of you in the shot. So as I just move around, quite straightforward, just, uh, That'll do. It won't be perfect because I did it very quickly. But you can now see a 3D representation of that scene. And that's what photogrammetry allows us to do, to rapidly build uh, 3D versions of real-world objects. So that's another part of the digital twinning process. Yeah, so photogrammetry is this idea, you've, you've all played with Google Earth, I imagine. Google Earth, you can go anywhere and see anywhere in 3D. It's particularly good on the VR headsets, if any of you have not tried it yet. You can just go down and, and enter these spaces. And, and in Google Earth terms, it's really just airplanes flying backwards and forwards. I don't know if you ever noticed, sometimes you see a little airplane flying over and it just goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. It's probably capturing this kind of data. There are other reasons, but that's one of the use cases. Um, another th interesting aspect of this digital twinning is game engine technology, which you'll see later because in this VR headset, I am, will be running a game engine. So game engines have come on leaps and bounds uh, in the last really 10 years. I mean, it's, it's always progressing, but recently it's mind boggling how far we've, we've come to the point where in the bottom left there, you can see it looks pretty real actually, but it's running real time in a game engine. Um, in the bottom right, if you've seen the Mandalorian or any other recent, particularly the Star Wars series, replacing the green screen. The green screens were great, but there were issues. So, well, let's replace it with giant LED screens, or TVs effectively, and uh, Unreal Engine technology, or game technology. And then we can have real tracking, match the lighting and everything else in real time, get the shot, and then it's ready to go. There's no go going later, removing the green screen and everything else. So game engine technology is another aspect of this digital twinning idea that's really exciting and moving fast. 
So I've mentioned the VR headset a few times. Um, VR has been around quite a long time. I remember in the 90s, it was really bad. I mean, there were big headsets in the top left there. They were heavy, uncomfortable to wear. There was uh, this idea of drift. So if I was stood still, not moving at all, but then got tired because they weighed a lot, and, and they did at the time, your head would droop, but the view would, didn't, didn't realize. So you'd be looking down like this, but you're in the VR world, you were looking forwards all the time. So they were very uncomfortable. They were slow. They were incredibly expensive. We've moved a long way. So bottom left is a Quest 2. That's one of these. These are relatively uh, inexpensive. I think they're about 300 pounds, 400 pounds, uh, which is, you know, in terms of, I know it's a lot of money, but for, uh, for what you get, that's an incredible uh, achievement, I think, for the VR space. You may have heard other terms like augmented reality. So augmented reality, you tend to just wear glasses and stuff is then presented to you uh, in a 3D space within that real space as well. And you can do that on your phone. There's plenty of AR apps. Does anyone remember Google Glass from 2013? Nine years since Google Glass launched when he parachuted into the into that Google show and everyone was like, what, what is this? This is amazing. Now, Google Glass, I think, was too early at the time. It was slow, again, very expensive. We have one in university and it's it's still very, it's not there yet. But they've continued development with the Google Glass Enterprise versions. So, you know, it's still moving. There's always the rumor that Apple are coming out with one at some point in the future. Um, but, you know, augmented reality is interesting. Then you get mixed reality, like the HoloLens, where we're, we're starting to see that um, those objects overlaid, but we're now being able to interact with them. And they all kind of come under this umbrella of extended reality. Um, top right is the uh, HoloLens example, which is, uh, again, another enterprise grade kind of expensive piece of kit. Um, what I love about VR is that you can buy one for 300 pounds and you can also buy one for five or six thousand. And, you, you know, there's a range of opportunities within that. But starting low is still really good. Um, it comes back to that off the shelf idea. I couldn't really do this presentation without mentioning the metaverse, could I really? I mean, the metaverse is, I know it's everywhere at the moment. Um, companies like Meta are putting a lot of money into it. Uh, I've seen people write metaverse because it's kind of, it's so in our consciousness at the moment. It's not a new idea. Uh, 1992 was the first idea of a metaverse. And then uh, top left, any, I don't know if anyone remembers Second Life, which was, I think, 2003-ish, something like that. Um, Second Life was the first iteration, if you will, of a metaverse. Although I don't think he used the term uh, when, when Linden Labs did this. I don't think he used the term metaverse. But this idea of being able to, to be in a space like this, all of us in, in a space with people elsewhere, same as today, this is being streamed. So there are people out in the world somewhere, hopefully watching, and there are you guys here watching this. But could we in the future all be in some metaverse space where we're all across the world, potentially on other planets eventually, but we're all together and we could test out ideas, experiment with um, um, safety or machinery or whatever it might be for this digital twinning idea. Um, oh, I forgot to mention on that last slide, bottom left, of course, I think Metaverse got a bit of a kick because of that popular book uh, and film. Um, and then Tron, of course, has been around since the 80s. And that idea, I think, is always of, of being inside the computer it makes it very exciting. So holding all this together is we need some kind of networking, don't we? None of this would work. As I said, this Pi, the headset, my phone, my laptop, they're all connected to my phone at the moment. My phone is connected via 5G to the internet. Now, what's interesting, I think, about this technology is we're reaching a, an interesting milestone in the speed is slowly going up. But more importantly is that second col or third column, the latency. It's the delay. For the gamers in the room, you will latency is key for you, isn't it? It's the one thing that we concentrate most on. We don't really worry about speed too much. We worry about latency. And as gamers, we understand that. But in, 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 in a in a digital twinning scenario, let's go back to my very first question. Is your surgery going to be done by a robot controlled by somebody in a, another country? Imagine if there was a delay. Yeah, that, at that point, it's life threatening, isn't it? It's no longer just, I've just, you know, lost this match. It's, I've lost my life. So there's, there's uh, 5G is creating interesting uh, milestone for us. And also it's the idea that we can connect so much more devices. A million devices per square kilometer. 
there are about 25 ish thousand people on campus let's say as a maximum um so but we can get a million devices that's a lot of devices per person and then you start adding in potentially all of the rooms have intelligence and they know how many people are in there they know how much the room's been utilized or how much lighting is being used we start adding devices but 5g is giving us that opportunity for that to happen so it's not just about speed it's now about delay as well what i didn't know until i was preparing for this is the maximum speed of 5g a terabit per second which is incredible kinds of speed because you imagine what 6g and 7g and the rest of it's going to bring in terms of there will be no delay will there really so all those little bits hopefully now you're starting to draw from each one and bring together this idea that we can connect things together over incredibly fast networks with very little delay so that's our 5g network we can capture and process massive amounts of data we can use ai and machine learning to kind of interpret that data we can capture real world objects even with my phone which is amazing how far we've come there we can visit these virtual worlds and we can use the the latest game engine technology so now we get to this idea of a digital twin so what is digital twinning it's basically that it's it's taking a digital twin of a real physical object in this example i've got a, a there's a plane there a building potentially some machinery and then there's the, the robot example as well so in this i'm going to do an example in a moment with this christmas tree because i didn't have a plane uh, handy or a building an entire building anyway um but why not twin the building as i say this building if there's no one in here why are the lights on why is the heating on if can we detect how many people have been in this room over any amount of time which then affects timetabling next year and says automatically that room was underutilized let's shut it down for a year and this room was 50 percent utilized as was this one let's merge those two things like that kind of data um in terms of um i built a system many years ago so that you could let's say we don't like purple anymore on this the wall in this room why not in the vr space i can look at that select it say i'd like it to be green now please and then that automatically sends a job to estates they update it it updates in my vr space as well as the real space those kinds of things are possible with digital twin um, i've also made this little cloud so the cloud is the 5g part and the little circle there is the digital twin using the internet of things all of this stuff connected together which generates a whole lot of data which then the ai and the machine learning starts to interpret and understand which feeds back into the digital twin and takes account of all of those other aspects so robot robotics game engines photogrammetry vr all become a part of that process so an example not the night sky this is where we we hope that everything works you know they say don't work with children or kids we may have to have vr headsets in a moment but let's see how we go so i'm going to disappear and i know you can't see anything yet but hopefully you will in a moment so let's um it's not going to crash it's going to work wonderfully so is that casting to that screen excellent cool so, so it's, no, this is great. So th this isn't the clever bit. This is just the standard VR headset world. It might be a little laggy for you guys. Um, it, it's running nice and smooth for me. So um, I'm going to open up a space, uh, and we're going to have a have a look and see what's going on. This is where we also rely on the, my Raspberry Pi connecting correctly as well. So hopefully you can see. Uh, unfortunately, our Mars rover is offline. I don't really have a Mars rover. I just thought that would be uh, a bit of fun. <laughs> Although it is quite cute, isn't it? So uh, let's see what else we've got. Um, the uh, the remote surgery. Should we? Luckily, that one's offline because I think we might make a mess with that. Might we? <laughs> but uh, anyway, luckily, our Christmas tree is online, hopefully. So the, you might recognize this tree. Um, where am I in terms of? Yes, it's in front of me, isn't it? So this, this uh, was photogrammetry just from my phone. So, you know, OK, it's not brilliant because I was using a phone. But, you know, with a macro lens, uh, you can you can move forward. I wanted to demonstrate the the very basic, if you will. Um, and this this was from from a phone camera. But as long as this is working, OK, in theory, I did the light come on on the tree. 
Yeah. So the, the, I've got to turn the light on at the top. Uh, I could change the color. So if you like, it can be a red, a red light instead. Um, and then I could let's change another one. So for those who might not be able to see, I'll make this one uh, green, and we'll let's make this one blue. So hopefully you can, you can see from every angle. Uh, I think I've managed to capture everybody. Uh, let's just move a bit further. We'll turn some on the other side in case you're out of out of view. Uh, let's make this one. We'll turn that one on. So uh, I now have a, a Christmas tree. Now, this is a, a tiny model Christmas tree. Um, but obviously, you know, this this could be anything. This could be the plane example. This could be, I'm going to take this off now because you, you've seen it in action. Um, you know, why couldn't that be a plane, a building, a train, anything? that we are controlling uh, digitally like that, and then it's sending data back. So this one, this tree doesn't have any buttons on, but I could have buttons on here to turn on and off these lights, which would send data back. So this is a two-way communication. So as I put, turn the light on here, if I had a, any buttons, that would turn on the virtual version. So let's say this is a piece of machinery. Somebody changes the ink cartridge in a printer. So the VR version knows that that is currently full of uh, ink. So we don't need to to go and chase it. You no, know, uh, somebody sat in an office anywhere on Earth could be monitoring thousands of printers, wandering up and down. Oh, that one's running out. I'll just click go. That'll send a job to the local printer refill person, and they will fix that problem. So, what are we doing in terms of this? Is just a, a very simple example of that. But what else are we doing as a as, as a research group? So. Um, some of my colleagues are here today, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the stuff that we're doing. Uh, navigation and change perception are an important part of this. If we're in a virtual space, let's go back to that example of uh, a building or a thousand printers in a room. How do I move around in that space? How do I navigate that space? How do I perceive changes in that space? If a printer of those thousand is running low on ink, how do I make the person aware? You don't want to wander down all thousand printers just to find out which one is the one that's a problem. Um, so that in the, the left there, that's a virtual scene, uh, a dentist scene. Over on the right, we're also looking at optimization. So these things, these headsets are basically just mobile phones stuck to your face with some lenses. That's all they really are. So if you say, I'm going to make a thousand polygon sword, it ain't going to work in there, is it? It's just, it's just not capable. So how do we optimize objects that we have scanned, potentially that Christmas tree, for example, uh, any other real world objects or generated objects? How do we make them run as efficiently as possible on low power headsets like this? We're also looking at things like physiological responses. So if I scare you in a game, what kind of response do you have physiologically? Or I want to try and calm you or whatever it might be. And then how do we learn from that in order to make that. So these printers in the room, I'll just go, I'll keep using the printer example. What if I could use some other stimulus to warn you? You suddenly get anxious for some reason. I can create anxiety in the game engine. You feel anxious, oh, I better check the printers. That might be unethical, maybe, <laughs> you know, do you see how we could, potentially there are ways that we could use that. And um, we're also looking at using brainwave data. So our brains obviously are firing all the time. Um, in a gaming a gaming example, imagine you're running through Call of Duty and you think grenade to throw grenade. You don't have to press the button. Yeah. But what about again in other scenarios, the uh, in a digital twinning scenario, in a metaverse type scenario, your current feeling changes the clothing that you're wearing or your perception, your your person in that space. Um, and then psychophysics. Um, that Christmas tree in the virtual world was lower resolution, you could tell it wasn't real. But at what point does it become real for us? To begin with, we see low resolution, poor quality, and we go, oh, it's rubbish. Yeah, And then there's the real version, which looks high, high fidelity, wonderful, perfect. Somewhere in the middle, there's a, there's a middle ground, isn't there, where it's efficient enough, but looks good enough. And yeah, that's what, another aspect. More broadly, as a university, Things like the smart house. So we have a smart house over in, in one of our buildings, which is wired up and collecting data all the time, trying to understand and interpret how buildings behave and in terms of um, usage of energy and water and power and so on. 
Uh, psychoacoustics. So how do you, let's go back to that printer example. How do you attract somebody's attention using audio potentially? Yeah, it's flash, there's a flashy light, but there's also an audio effect. As you're running through a space or you're flying your virtual plane linked to the real plane, what about audio that's telling you something's not quite right? If you're in a car and something's not quite right mechanically, you can you can feel it. You can sense it. I know my clutch is going. Yeah, and I, I can sense that. How do you get that across into the virtual space as well? Maybe through sound. Um, CPT, I think I saw a CPT person here, actually. So Center of Precision Technologies, they have some robots that would quite happily squash you, I think. They're huge in, in, um, industrial machines, industrial robots. And they're surrounded by cages, effectively, because if you go near them, they don't know that you're there. So they will just move anyway. So could we map those into a virtual space and then move them in a virtual world, know where other things are, Internet of Things? I've, I have a badge on all the time, and there's a, my, my card. Why couldn't this tell machinery where I am in that space so that it knows not to squash me? And then potentially external interests, so things like building management, building maintenance, plastic surgery visualization. If you're going for some plastic surgery, why not hold up a virtual mirror and see it, what you might look like? So to finish with, um, how could you get involved? It depends where you are in your career. Maybe you're thinking about university. Um, there are degrees in all of these things. Uh, we actually have them all at Huddersfield. So you could go on a degree for one of these things uh, in, this, in this wheel of stuff. Um, if you're uh, further along, you're a researcher maybe, or you're a final year project student, and you're thinking, well, I don't know what to do for my final year project. Maybe something here will inspire you in that sense. And for researchers, you know, maybe you're working in one of these fields. We have a lot of, I have a lot of colleagues working in big data, AI. Maybe there are ways that you've not thought of so far um, that ideas here might be able to be brought into that uh, research that you're doing, kind of crossing those boundaries. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I think we're going to move to some, some Q&A. Well, thank you, Duke, for a fascinating uh, lecture. I have to say I was hugely impressed personally that um, you were so brave in, in doing so much live demo work. I've, I've seen <laughs> that go horribly long in the past, so, yeah, yeah. so well done. Um, so I've got a couple of questions for you, but then we're going to open it out to the audience here in the room and also online. Um, so, so, so my first question is, um, where did your interest in computer science um, come from and digital twinning? And, and how did it lead to the career that you have now and, and the fascinating research area that you, you're now working in? So uh, back in 32 years ago, Amstrad released a console called the GX4000. Uh, I didn't know at the time, but it was one of the worst selling consoles of all time. Uh, and I asked for one for my birthday and my parents said, uh, no, 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 we'll buy you a PC. So I got an actual machine, an actual computer. There was no Windows back then. Uh, this was DOS, if anyone knows about the early operating systems. Uh, I had no mouse, for example. Uh, and that was that ignited that love of computing really and it, it was uh, downhill from there <laughs> so, just continuous computing everything and i think uh, my slightly magpie approach to things shiny lights on a tree for example you know uh, new, latest technology uh, is um, keeps me interested all the time it's fascinating i may look, not look old enough but i had something called a commodore vic 20 okay. um, and i remember being very excited at Christmas because I was going to get an 8k expansion pack yeah. which cost 80 pounds yeah. so the, the cost is, has really come down as well which is, and obviously the computing price is slightly better than my computer yeah. so uh, and from my perspective this is all new to me I'm a mechanical engineer so it's all fascinating stuff but where do you see us in in terms of digital twinning in the future what's the next big thing I mean there's lots of big concepts out there isn't there but for me it's the metaverse for instance is fascinating you know do you think we'll all be meeting and bumping into each other online and shopping together in, in the near future or do you think that's a little bit i don't know it's an interesting wasn't it because i think if you go back far enough we wouldn't have i don't imagine we all thought we'd be shopping online at christmas rather than going out into onto a high street um i remember trying second life back in mid 2000 you know 2005 six when it was relatively new and the idea was great but it wasn't we weren't ready as a in terms of the technology it wasn't fast enough um, I think, yes, there is a there is a chance. I mean, if you think about the films, but then it, if you go far enough, 
if anyone's watched films like Wally, where they just end up on a spaceship in space and they don't they forget how to interact with each other. Um, there's always that risk, isn't there? But I think as humans, we're we're sociable people. We need, I think, we'll always need this physical as well as um, digital. But it's uh, it's exciting, very exciting. So, so just for, just for the online audience, the question there was, uh, what's your thought on the metaverse um, as opposed to sort of VR? I think it's an yeah an interesting question. Is VR chat already the metaverse? I think the the, the metaverse is what is what is the metaverse in the sense of everybody's trying. I don't think anybody really knows what they want from it. I think we we everybody saw the book Ready Player One. If you, I think most a lot of people either read the book or have seen the film Ready Player One, and then that seemed to be a bit of a trigger to go, oh, we all need this now. But I'm, VR chat is the VR chat metaverse. Is any VR interaction with another person an early version of the metaverse? And if we go back far enough to Second Life, the second Second Life was really the metaverse, and that's 20, 19 years old, I think now. So I think the metaverse really is a, is just a term that we use for a virtual space, um, and it's continually evolving and getting better and faster. So more affordable uh, VR chat, yes, is the metaverse. Next version of VR is going to be even better with all of the face tracking. So now in VR chat you can chat, but there's no if you smile that doesn't come across. With the next, unless you use the emotes, but in the next version when it can see your face. So the, the the idea that it's already working in, in is, is yes, but it's I think we're, we're always moving forward. It's all everything in computing. It's always moving all the time. You know, you go back twenty years, no one had a mobile. Well, very few people had a mobile phone. You know, and now it's very rare to find somebody without one. I think it'll be similar with VR headsets. Thanks for that question. Any more questions? Yeah, we we have a question on on ethics in terms of AI and prediction of of. of, of of your future or your health or whatever it might be. So the ethics side of things, I guess, is an important aspect. It is, and I think it comes back to there's, there's a continuous discussion about privacy and how much we allow somebody else to know about us, how much the doctor knows or the government or an organization. And that's why we have cookie control on our computers. So um, it is an interesting question. I mean, probably crop up quite a lot. There's a recent ethics discussion now around ChatGPT and the the image generators, around them using other artwork to generate new artwork. Who owns the new artwork? What does the AI own the new artwork? Does the original artist that contributed to that artwork own that artwork? So there are going to be a lot of ethics type discussions, I think, as we move forward into the next generation of AI, machine learning, VR spaces, metaverse. Um, who owns my digital image in the metaverse? If I scan myself on a photogrammetry type scenario and then put myself in that VR world, but then somebody steals my 3D model, um, who owns that? I don't know. These, uh, these will, I think all of this stuff will be discussed and, and fought over for years to come. And just to add, I sold my face for a bottle of Bex when I was a student to go in a football game. I don't know whether it ever got used, but it seemed like a good price to me at the time. OK, I think we had another question in the room at the front here. So so the question is is related to how when we get very close to things looking real, how, how do we feel about that? How do, what does that promote in us as a feeling as, as humans? There's, there's quite a lot of research on, on the Uncanny Valley. So the idea that as we get closer and closer to real was an aversion. Um, I suppose there's two, although there's quite a lot of research that says it's not a real thing uh, as well. So there's two sides to that research for the Uncanny Valley. Um, I agree there are some recent films where uh, they've tried to bring back actors who've passed away and or, or uh, reduce the age of actors uh, and they turn around and you immediately go, oh, that's there's something wrong there. The rest of the film is great. That moment ruined it. Um, I think it's interesting that we kind of we're always trying to build versions of humans. Why are we not building more efficient robots? If we go to robotics, for example. So Boston Dynamics, uh, their their best robot, if you will, is actually got four legs, and their mule has four legs because it can carry a lot more weight. You know, where it depends what you're going to do. If you're going to interact with a hotel desk clerk, you probably want them to be relatively human looking in order to interact with them. But if its job is to carry or build a car, then why not make it look like something else? It's an interest. In Uncanny Valley is quite interesting. And my colleagues who spend a lot of time in building 3D models and teaching our students about 3D, I think that's a big part of what they do. We have an entire module on character 
development and they choose characters that aren't humans i think or move away from humans and some of that is probably for the uncanny valley type issues question uh, relating to whether we can uh, whether ai could replace our artists i'm sure anyone from the arts would be a little bit worried if they heard that but yeah i, I don't think so i think there's the potential for the grunt work the easy stuff let's knock out some really bait like a wood texture let's say maybe but uh, you'll always need artists because their 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 creativity i don't think maybe even hundreds of years away maybe but in the, in in the re closer term the, the that the ability i i'm always amazed by creative people and artists what they can do it blows my mind you know how they can you can say i'd like a, a logo that gets across the idea of um calmness let's say and they just and it generates and it's amazing i think there is a place i know a lot of artists are starting with ai so getting like the underlying idea so it's I, I'd give me some suggestions of where to start and then they might t in the set but then you do that anyway if you think about a mood board you would go on to somewhere and find some similar if you're building a tank i'll pick a game example you're building a tank you're going to look at lots of pictures of tanks but if you just said okay i want tanks that are futuristic an ai might generate some and you'll pick some ideas oh i like that i'll, I'll pull from that idea so there might be some room for the starting point but no i think artists will always be required for that to make something unique and interesting questions uh, whether there's any industries already using digital twinning from online there's a lot of experimentation with digital twinning um i know of some robotics industries that are using it around um uh, i can't say too much because of the i've signed an nda but the, they are using uh digital twinning for a particular high risk job in robotics um so that's quite interesting um and i think everyone's a lot of companies are experimenting with it um i've had a lot of uh seen a lot of stuff in the news a lot of interest from people saying oh we're thinking of this we're interested about this idea what can we explore some ideas um the two on the bottom of the last slide the, the dentist the first plastic surgery example that was a somebody last week saying we're thinking of doing this kind of stuff can we is there anything we can do to work together so yeah the question is around accessing the metaverse for different social demographics and whether we, we can make that accessible for all that was a big part of the book actually wasn't it uh, the book the book and the, the film that was uh, from a few years ago it is it will be important um that's why i think for me it's very exciting what uh, it was palmer lucky wasn't it about 2013 who started with the uh, oculus stuff um, and he was tr basically just off the shelf components mobile phones strapped to your face um, if you think about google cardboard that was any phone with a piece of cardboard you could print from the web cut it out and reshape it to create um, a, a rudimentary vr type system so it will be a challenge i think we can say that of most technologies that it will always the west i guess or america maybe as the biggest superpower will will have the best versions probably of most things and then it will uh, progress around the world yes it will always be a challenge but i think we can say that with most things okay thank you well i think it's time we should probably be wrapping up so i'd just like to take this opportunity to thank duke for his excellent presentation and also like to thank everybody in the room for their questions you did a great job and of course those online as well so thank you very much for your questions just to let you know that there's a there's a suite of discover lectures that have already been recorded that you can you can catch i'm coming on mic here that you can catch on online and of course look out for, for new discover lectures as well so so thank you very much everybody